Today, I'll talk about the origins of Hugue, that desirable, mysterious state of harmony and well being associated with the Scandinavian lifestyle. Uh, it's the subject of my next uh, monograph. Hygge is the emotional byproduct of Scandinavian values and of a society, social safety net ensured by the political movement Social Democracy, which began in the second half of the 19th century and was part of the socialist labor awakening. Hygge connotes a sense of personal safety and security, of feeling comfortable about one's identity and how one fits into society. It also includes freedom to pursue one's desires as long as they don't minimize the freedom of others. These values must be shared by the national community in order to function. Developing a sense of national common ground through democratizing opportunities and legal status is as crucial a part of that project as is a shared national identity. In Denmark, this all began in the 18th century. The creation of modern national identities is usually associated with the post-Napoleonic era and with the philosophy of idealism, including such influential works as Johann Gottlieb Fichte's 1808 Address to the German Nation, which of course was not a nation until six decades later. In Denmark, this process of national identity formation began almost a century earlier. There, as in many German-speaking lands, a close relationship developed between the nobility and the bourgeoisie, many of whom shared the same Enlightenment philosophy. Tugerot, who we see here in a neoclassical style bust and in a painted portrait, was a University of Copenhagen professor and the tutor of Crown Prince Frederick later King Frederick V. Rotte wrote a text similar to Fichte's, but half a century earlier in 1757. In letter regarding love of one's homeland, Rotte observed that personal freedom fostered patriotism, a truly revolutionary idea at the time of rigid social hierarchies. In fact, Danish society existed in relative harmony in the 18th century during the reign of Frederick V, who reigned from 1746 until 1766. You see him portrayed here shortly after becoming king. The print shows his funeral, an event filled with Masonic imagery, pyramids, stairs, solar and female allegorical symbols, the checkered floor and twisted columns allegedly present in the palace of antiquity's wisest king, Solomon. This is significant because in, early, in the early 18th century, uh, Freemasonry was established in London and it was the primary conduit for enlightenment ideas. These ideas spread rapidly in European intellectual circles through Freemasonry's inter international network of lodges. America's founding fathers and the masterminds of the French Revolution were all, or mostly, Freemasons. The foundational values of Freemasonry are integrity, respect, friendship, and charity. Frederick V, who was usually too drunk and preoccupied with women to actually rule the country, employed counselors who were also Freemasons, and it was they who did the actual governing. German-born Count Adam von Moltke was the most important counselor and 
As concurrently director of the East Asiatic Company, he promoted humane and empowering policies that anticipated neoliberalism. The English visitor Urbain Roger described the singular quality of life in Denmark in this way, quote, here no prince rules with violence or suppresses the freedom of his subjects through deception or secrecy. The Danish king rules in a spirit that makes clear that he understands his sovereign responsibility to make decisions that are in the best interest of the general public. This approach guarantees the harmony and equality essential to the health and vitality of the national body politic, end quote. The king, nobility, and rapidly growing educated middle classes of Denmark were convinced that agreement regarding the proper path for the Danish nation would lead to an economically strong country and to a loyal citizenry. Denmark achieved economic power in several ways, through trade, mainly with the East Asiatic Company, which was established in 1732, and through land reform, which established a new social class, independent landowning farmers. Here we see an example of such a farm. In contrast, the Swedish government forced inhabitants to build houses on individual tracts of land in the late 18th century by burning down villages. This generated hostility between peasants and the state and ruined the cohesiveness of Swedish village life. In Denmark, in contrast, land reform was initiated voluntarily by aristocratic Danish landowners. First time, the right to relocate within Denmark. Previously, the landowners and the priests' permissions were required. Peasants were so grateful for this land reform uh, that they erected a commemorative freedom monument in honor of King Christian VII and Crown Prince Frederick. The monument seen here was paid for by public subscription and designed by the director of Denmark's Royal Academy of Art, uh, Nikolai Oblogod. The April 3rd issue of the journal Minerva, which I couldn't find, but, and in this, it read, on this day, his majesty has abolished serfdom. After great consideration, he has decided to award rights and responsibilities to his industrious and effective citizens because he has realized that the king, the nobility, and all Danes should enjoy the same rights. This legal equality includes the protection of property and all general possessions of all citizens, end quote. Freedom Monument, uh, as it was called, was installed in front of the Western Gate to the city. And it remains on that spot on Vestbrugade uh, until today, although the city gate has been replaced by Copenhagen Central Station. If you've been to Copenhagen, you have undoubtedly seen, if not noticed, the significant historical marker. As far as I am aware, this is the very first assertion by a monarch of the legal and by extrapolation, the intellectual, moral, physical, and spiritual equality of all humans. Significantly, this law also applied to women, since uh, the people who wrote it could have used language that would have excluded women, but they chose not to. If today one is searching for why the Scandinavian countries enjoy greater gender equality, this is one of many historical reasons. The idea to commemorate this event, the monument, came from the Natural History Society. Established in 1789, the year of the French Revolution, 
The organization was directed by Peter Christian Abelgar, brother of the Art Academy director. The society was established to compensate for the lack of science taught at Copenhagen University, which focused then on um, the humanities. The society offered academic training and played remarkably a crucial role in fostering Denmark's democratic, patriotic, pedagogical, and scientific development. Comparison of an early sketch for the monument uh, by Nikolai Obligard with the completed monument shows the top that the top was modified. Instead of placing an allegorical figure of prosperity, and that's what he drew there, uh, atop a column, he decided to make an obelisk. During the 18th century, when excavations at Herculaneum and Pompeii focused the attention of the educated public on the ancient world, obelisks stimulated thoughts of the ancient past, especially, of course, of Egypt. Abelgard had studied in Rome and seen the imported hieroglyphic covered ob uh, Egyptian obelisk in St. Peter's Square. Hieroglyphics weren't decoded until the 1820s by Jean-Francois Champollion. And in the 18th century, they were assumed to convey crucial secret knowledge to a future generation that would be able to read it. Abelgard liked the idea of obelisks containing important secret messages and changed his format. His obelisk is inscribed on two sides. The side facing Copenhagen reads, quote, the king knew that through legally guaranteeing freedom of movement, he encouraged his subjects love of their homeland of, um, of, of love of their homeland, their thirst for knowledge and industriousness, thereby fostering their happiness, end quote. As far as I know, this is the first ever public reference to a monarch being concerned with the happiness of his subjects, and it was a portent of things to come. The side facing the countryside reads, quote, the king has decided to abolish serfdom. He gives country dwellers his solemn word that these free, courageous, and enlightened farmers can be loyal and happy, end quote. It was significant that Abelgard chose Danish for the text at a time when the majority of literate citizens read and often spoke mostly, if not exclusively, German. And the majority of Danish speakers were illiterate and therefore unable to read the monument's text. The choice of stone also express, expressed patriotism. The obelisk is made of sandstone from the island of Bornholm, and the plinth is made of Norwegian marble silent acknowledgement that laws made in Denmark apply equally to all its territories. Effective use of indigenous natural resources constituted a crucial aspect of the Danish physiocratic program. At the corners of the plinth stand four life-size female figures representing loyalty, hard work, efficient farming, and love of homeland, the qualities of the ideal Danish citizen. Landscape painting documented the peaceful land reform process. One of the first estates to experiment with land reform was Gentofte, the main residence of Johann Hartwig von Bernstorff, who was Denmark's foreign minister from 1751 to 1770. In 1766, just one year after construction of his manor house was completed, von Bernstorff began selling his villages of Gentofte, Van Gede, and Urdrup to their inhabitants, 
creating 42 new and independent farms in the process. In this painting by Eric Powelson, Gentofte at Twilight, we see to the left in the distance, the village of Gentofte with its church and to the right, a newly built farmhouse at the end of a wide modern road. The last rays of the setting sun illuminate the village in the background, which represents the past, just as the farmstead represents Denmark's future. Like a castle, the large orderly farm dominates the landscape from its hill. The stand of trees in the center create a symmetrical composition, one that suggests stability, harmony, and peace. The obsolete feudal past recedes in memory as the future of free independent farmers literally rises above it. In 1788, Powelson painted a landscape that included the memorial erected five years earlier by local farmers in von Pernsdorf's honor. All who worked on the project donated their labor in a show of social solidarity, including Abelgard's own professor at the Art Academy, the sculptor Johannes Wiedewelt, who designed it. Three men stand before the sculpture. Their identities may be indicated by the play Fall Harvest, a theater piece written by Thomas Tarup and first performed in Copenhagen. There, toward the end of the play, three men, each from a different part of the Danish empire, Zeeland, Holstein, and Norway, stand before the von Bernstorff Memorial. This painting shows the agricultural productivity possible in an egalitarian society. On the left, we again see the village of Gentofte, and on the right, harvest activities on von Bernstorff's former estate. His bold experiment of giving away land demonstrated that the increasingly restrictive measures that tied Danish peasants to the land on which they were born for increasingly long periods finally from four years old until 40, resulted in no agricultural improvement. Whereas empowering peasants by giving them their own land produced immediate results. Here Powelson presented on the left, a peaceful landscape and the amicable relationship among social classes, the nobility, tenant farmers, free land owning farmers and wealthy landowners while on the right and on the left, while uh, and on the right, poor a poor farmer relaxes uh, from his labors. Artist Jens Yule, who taught the German Romantic painters Caspar David Friedrich and Philip Otto Runge during their years at the Copenhagen Academy in the 1790s, also painted an autumn scene of a farm partitioned from Gentofte in a painting whose title translates as sea farm, Frugord. Here we see in the distance the familiar silhouette of Gentofte's church, shaded by a tree in the middle ground, and in the foreground center, one of the new farms. Stormy weather approaches from the right without disturbing the productive labor underway. And in the left, foreground, a farmer guides his wagon, uh, gu guides his wagon uh, to work in the fields. Uh, beside the gate, we see a woman and child standing in front of a small storage building. Bushes, trees, and a small lake mark the boundary between properties. Sheep grazing in the field and smoke rising from a chimney indicate that someone is home as a man on horseback approaches. Soon the woman will open the gate and when he passes, will again close it to keep the animals from wandering away. Thomas Bugg, the first owner of this painting was an enlightenment intellectual and president of Copenhagen University. 
He was also the man primarily responsible for the successful land reform that occurred in Zeeland during the 1760s, a reform inspired by Bernstorff's Gentofte experiment. One can well imagine Bugge, that Bugge considered his painting an important celebration of the reform's success. Because the Danish economy became increasingly dependent on the agricultural productivity of the newly liberated peasants, the government realized that it was in its best interest to help them. For this reason, the Royal Agricultural Society was established in 1769. To effectively communicate best agricultural practices and the latest research developments, it published a journal and subsidized the publication of handbooks for farmers, bureaucrats, and gardeners. To foster innovation, the Royal Agricultural Society offered prizes for discoveries and inventions that would be useful for any aspect of agriculture or horticulture. As a consequence of these initiatives, peasant literacy became crucial to the Danish economy beginning in the mid 18th century. In 18th century Denmark, there was consensus that a well-educated citizenry made the state stronger. For that reason, in 1772, German, previously the language of the educated elite and the Danish bureaucracy, was abandoned and Danish declared the official language for the first time. Thus, improvement in both the reading and writing of Danish suddenly became critical for all members of society. And beginning in 1775, Danish was taught uh, in elite public schools. No longer was it true for a bourgeois or aristocrat, ge aristocratic gentleman that he spoke Latin with educated colleagues, German with male friends, French with women, diplomats, and foreigners, and Danish with peasants. In the 18th century, the majority of Danish nobles and bureaucrats were native German speakers. Multilingualism was considered cosmopolitan and modern. But this opinion began to fade as it became important to establish a single national language in order to foster a generic national identity. This tendency became urgent in the wake of the Stroyense affair, which started in 1769 when the psychotic Danish king Christian VII visited Hamburg and found a doctor, Johann Friedrich Stroyense, who was able to successfully treat the symptoms of his illness. Stroyense accompanied the deranged king back to Copenhagen and ruled indirectly, enabling Stroyense to enact many egalitarian enlightenment measures, such as equality of all before the law and the requirement for nobles to pay taxes, measures that Friedrich, Frederick the Great of Prussia Louis XVI of France and Josef II of Austria tried unsuccessfully to implement in their own countries. Stroyense also enjoyed an intimate romantic relationship with the German-born Queen Caroline Matilda from Celle, with whom he produced a daughter. Stroyense's reforms and privileged royal access angered the nobles. They conspired with the king's mother to accuse Stroyense of treason and to trick the king into signing a decree that Stroyense be executed, an event that occurred in 1772. Queen Caroline was sent back to her family in Sel, and the Danish bureaucracy was radically Danified as a result. Cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism was out and national protectionism was in. Nonetheless, an interest in fostering a generic, na ge a generic da Danish national identity had begun earlier among Danish intellectuals. In order to encourage the institution of Danish as the national language, the librarian Jakob Langebeck 
had begun compiling a Danish dictionary several decades earlier. And in 1752, the Swiss historian Henri Mallet published the very first history of Denmark. To further encourage literacy, the Royal Library was opened free into the public beginning in 1796. It also allowed citizens to take books home to read, a novel concept at the time. Knowledge was no longer the exclusive property of a particular social democratic demographic, but to all. Land reform offered clear economic and social advantages because newly established property owning interest groups identified closely with the land of Denmark, thanks to their new partial ownership of it. These land owning peasants were now viewed by the government as productive, efficient and patriotic. Many initiatives implemented in the 18th century strengthened this patriotism and created a national identity that portrayed Denmark as a nation with strong traditions and a long history. In Sweden, in contrast, it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that a similar initiative called Know Your Country was created by the newly established Swedish Tourism Board. In 1792, the Ant Danish Antiquarian Society, or the Collegium Antiquariatum, was founded by Hans Graham, professor of Greek at Copenhagen University. Let me just see what's next, okay. Um, its mission was the collection and documentation of historical evidence from Denmark's past. Its name, later changed to the Royal Academy for Science and Literature, was later changed to the Royal Academy for Science and Literature. The society documented a broad range of material and traditional culture, monuments and memorials, customs and, and practices, utilitarian objects, evidence of the Christianization of Denmark, coinage, language transformation, Scandinavian history in general, and the relationship of Denmark to its territories, both colonial and European. Membership in the antiquarian society was open to all and included aristocrats, scholars and scientists, merchants, clerics, bakers, and students. An extremely democratic membership for the 18th century. Langebeck was a member, as was Søren Abelgaard, father of the artist Nikolai and the natural scientist Peter Christian. In 1745, uh, Langebeck founded the Royal Danish Society for Homeland uh, History and in order to encourage research and publication on native historical topics. Its journal, Danske Magazine, is still published today, fostering a connection to the past that reinforces feelings of stability and continuity, two essential elements of Hygge. The cartouche of the Society for Homeland History shows that the basis of a harmonious society is education and literacy, as well as working together. Reading brings understanding, and with understanding comes tolerance. Human relations profit by collaboration and teamwork, as demonstrated by the articles published in Danska magazine, which fe featured research projects intended to promote Ag uh, agrarian improvements. The cartouche clearly shows that men working together in the fields are part of a larger landscape filled with culture and history, which are suggested by the books. Søren Abelgaard excavated, documented, and conducted research on Denmark's natural and cultural heritage. Every summer between 1756 and 1776, he traveled throughout Denmark sketching runestones, buildings, landscapes, monuments, objects, and flora and fauna. During winters, he made copper engravings of these treasures with the help of his sons, uh, both of whom developed a passion for observing, describing, and understanding. Peter Christian utilized his skills to better comprehend animal physiology and behavior 
and became a veterinarian. Nikolai was more interested in culture and profited by Stroyanze's egalitarian measures that enabled students at the School of Applied Arts uh, and Handicraft to take night courses at the Royal Academy of Art to study painting. Nikolai was mainly a history painter and employed by the king. For this reason, he was required to behave diplomatically and design paintings acceptable to his employer. At the same time, his childhood exposure to Danish history and material culture and his participation in the Enlightenment-oriented Natural History Society informed his passionate egalitarianism an attitude confirmed by the contents of his personal library and the comments he wrote in his books. His situation was comparable to that of, the, of his contemporary Spanish court painter, Francisco Goya, who was similarly frustrated by his restrictive work environment. Abogard was extremely clever, and even in his paint, palace paintings on the walls of the knight's room of Christian Christiansborg Palace in Copenhagen, his Enlightenment convictions emerge. In his painting Christian III Comforting Denmark in 1535, an allegorical female figure in yellow represents the Danish nation and is helped to rise from a subservient kneeling position on a lower step by the Danish king. This was the year the king changed the state religion from Roman Catholicism, with the Pope as head of the church, to Lutheranism, within which the local ruler serves as head of the church. Christian III visited the Congress of Worms in 1521 and was so impressed by Martin Luther that he declared Lutheranism, uh, Lutheranism, the official religion of his home state of Schleswig in 1528 and of all Denmark in 1535. In this image, Abelgard omitted the fact that forcing Danes to abandon Roman Catholicism required the help of 3,000 German mercenaries. Abelgard here portrayed the king as a wise and strong leader. The Abelgard men were all secularly oriented Freemasons who valued the ideals of French Republican revolutionaries, freedom, equality, and solidarity. Minerva, who stands in the background with a helmet, represents intelligence, education, art, and war. In Abelgard's painting, she appears determined to protect Enlightenment values. In 1744, an ancient tomb mound was discovered in the park of Jaeger's Priest Palace, the res residence of Crown Prince Frederick. In the 1770s, its excavation inspired the Danish Prime Minister, Minister Uwe Hug Guldberg, to transform it into a patriotic memorial park, honoring outstanding citizens from Danish territories. The form the memorials took was left to the decision of the sculptor Johannes Wiedewelt. In a letter he wrote to uh, Hugh Goldberg on December 16, 1776, the sculptor explained his idea, quote, I have tried to give future citizens an idea about the important events that have affected our nation. My earliest designs are very simple and distinguished only by words and names. But later I began to embellish them with relevant images, including allegorical figures. Greek and Roman memorials inspired me to seek inspiration in our own history and to create elements um, that help visitors to understand the memorialized person's significance for Denmark." End quote. Wiedewelt believed that just as the human figure was the point of departure for the aesthetic values of Mediterranean cultures, so abstract forms and ideas were the appropriate point of departure for Northern cultures. He represented the ancient Danish kings Froda the peace lover and Gorm the old, as well as more recent important personages like the astronomer Tycho Brahe, the Norwegian 
a governor, Hannibal Seestead, the Icelandic historian Tormod Torfeus, and the ice and the green early green, Greenland settlers Hans Egede and his wife Gertrud Rask. Wiedewelt's modern memorials harmonized well with the pre-existing ones found at Jaeger's Priest, giving the impression that they too might have been serendipitously discovered by contemporary archaeologists. The Jaeger's Priest Memorial Park was a kind of open air pantheon that honored men of thought and men of action. Because it was publicly accessible and a beloved excursion destination for Copenhagen residents, it functioned as a consensus building educational and patriotic excursion into history and into nature. Knowledge about Danish nature was encouraged by the appointment in 1752 of the German botanist Georg Christian Oder as director of the newly established botanical garden. Although Oder was also engaged in the politics of land reform, Flora Danica was his most significant project. He envisioned it as an encyclopedia of all plants growing in Danish lands. In order to make this knowledge widely available, the Danish government funded the printing of two uncolored copies of each volume for each parish. Because the botanical garden was located beside the art academy, art academy students were surrounded by nature and by botanical research. The art academy was housed in Charlottenburg Palace where the natural history collections of flora and fauna were also kept, and many art students contributed to Flora Danica during their studies. The Danish Art Academy was the only one that enjoyed such a close link with nature and scientific research. These efforts at documenting and spreading knowledge of Danish culture, geography, history, and privileging literacy for economic and religious reasons accompanied democratic, me measures, um, democratic measures like free and obligatory public schools and open membership to Copenhagen's many special interest societies and associations, including the Freemasons. Typically, the overall impression, rather than the details, was most important in 18th century landscape painting which imitated either uh, 17th century French painter, Nicolas Poussin, or um, the natural and informal appearing landscapes of uh, Dutch artist, Jacob van Reisdal. Danish painter Jens Juel combined these two tendencies with the non-judgmental egalitarian outlook of Enlightenment Danes although with a more precise rendering of botanical detail than was typical of his contemporaries. Like the Abelgaard brothers, Yule belonged to the Natural History Society and a Masonic Lodge. While making a living mainly as a portrait painter, he evidenced as deep an interest in describing nature as in, as in portraying human activity. Ewell likely attended the botanical lectures held regularly during the 1790s at the Natural History Society. In any event, he was a great admirer of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The parents of his first love, Susanne Holm, referred to her as Ju Julie, or Julie, because she was born in 1761, the same year as uh, the publication of Rousseau's book, Julie, or the new Heloise. During Yule's stay in Geneva as guest of the famous natural scientist um, Charles Bonnet, the artist frequently sketched the surrounding nature. In coastal landscape near Jaeger's Pries, Yule presented a peaceful nature featuring a famous oak, uh, which we see illuminated in the middle ground. Here we find Yule including a reference to the passing of time if we read the painting uh, from left to right. The old oak is illuminated by the sun, 
representing an idyllic moment in the past, while the young oak at left, as well as the two men who convey a trunk uh, of a tree in the foreground with the help of a horse-drawn drawn wagon, can be interpreted as representing the youthful and productive future. In the foreground, we see how exacting Yule was with the indication of a specific location uh, where he describes plants and flowers. And I'm sorry, I don't have a detail to show you. His precise descriptions, along with the indication of a specific location in the title, suggests that Yule's painting is a faithful record of a place. The science, truth, freedom, harmony, and order we notice in Yule's painting are found also in works by his students. Here, for example, we see images of a popular excursion, excursion destination, Amelie's Spring, painted by Yule in 1784 and drawn by Friedrich in 1797. Emily Spring commemorates the too early death of Ernst Heinrich Schimmelmann's wife. One can imagine that Friedrich accompanied his teacher on an outdoor sketching session to this place. Already in his student years, we recognize in Friedrich a preference for spirituality over socializing. There are like no people. Yule, however, painted a harmonious scene where nature, culture, and Danes mingle without regard for social status. We see here Hygge manifested in 18th century Denmark long before it became trendy. We also see manifested here the ideals of social democracy in which everyone is healthy, happy, and helpful. We see the small boy offering water to the elegant couple approaching from the right, and on the left, a, a girl accompanying a male figure, perhaps her father, looks up to him, literally. Two women converse by the fountain, sharing information, and a gentleman dressed in the Republican revolutionary colors of red, white, and blue assumes a thoughtful position, a pose leaning against the low wall behind the sculpture. Yule's most important Danish student, Christopher Eckersberg, father of the Danish golden age, focused his attention on promoting a Danish national identity, as did his followers. View of Mons Klint documents the modern activity of nature tourism, one promoted by Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his journal about walking alone in nature. The artist included two na natural wonders, the chalk cliffs of the island of Mons and an ancient several hundred years old oak tree. The spot has been equipped with a protective fence and benches for resting and admiring the view. One gentleman rests on a bench while the other reassures a frightened woman who turns away from the majestic view. It suggests that the woman experiences discomfort when removed from her usual domestic environment. But it also is a moment of empathy and education as the man who brought her here makes reassuring gestures intended to foster an understanding that will diminish the woman's fear. In Order Gord Park, Eckersberg portrayed a peasant girl resting beside a cart path through the forest. She sits a fully integrated part of nature where we see hints of human habitation behind the trees. This vision of a contemporary world of social harmony fueled by empathy, one in which humans understand their humble role in the world and cohabitated appreciatively and symbiotically in a dom with nature is a dominant characteristic of Danish Golden Age painting. Christian Kubke's portrait of his landscape painting colleague, Friedrich Södring, evidences a state of hygge. The rosy-cheeked artist appears comfortable and happy in his tasteful Biedermeier style interior. He holds a palette and brush, so his profession is as clear as the light that enters from a window at right. He sits in an upholstered chair, 
which half a century earlier would have only been found in the homes of aristocrats. The healthfulness of nature is indicated by the potted plant, nature brought indoors, new knowledge brought by enlightenment, curiosity, and scientific investigation. The folding stool leaning out of the painting at right is equipment Sudring uses when working outdoors. The sketches hanging on the wall are likely products, <clears throat> excuse me, are likely products of his outdoor expeditions. But oil painting at that date was strictly an indoor activity. Oil paint in tubes, the technology at that day, uh, the technology that enabled impressionists to paint outdoors didn't become commercially available until the 1860s, the decade when Impressionism developed. The bilateral symmetry here, generated by the mirror and vertical wall molding beneath it, create a compositional balance that reflects relative reality of a harmonious society. In his landscape of Lake Sortendam and the dock on his property, to the, on the painting on the right, Kubka again utilized bilateral symmetry with the flagpole marking the boundary between public space, the lake and departing boat, factories, town with church in the distance on the left, and on the right, the leafy realm of the artist. His private domain isn't protected by a wall because Danish society was one in which citizens and their possessions were respected and where individuals felt both free and secure, protected symbolically here by the Danish flag, a symbol of both king and nation. In Scandinavia toward the end of the 19th century, the cultural movement National Romanticism joined forces with the political movement Social Democracy to shape modern Scandinavian states. Significantly, many of their essential characteristics, the inherent equality of citizens, the necessity of all citizens uh, to contribute to national harmony and prosperity, the importance of empowering all citizens with education and the knowledge that enables uh, them to aid the nation, had already existed in Denmark for more than a century. Ushen Janssen, as it is for May 1st demonstrations for workers' rights in the painting at left, although the painting's asymmetry suggests dynamism and a progressive so and progressive social change. Ricard Barry, a passionate feminist as well as a passionate socialist, painted Nordic summer evening to suggest an ideal world of harmony and balance, one that is achievable because he represents it in his own day. Uh, the woman, a popular Danish singer, stands across from the Swedish painter prince, Ushen. Their postures are similar. Um, and Berg made this choice purposefully, as he explained it, to indicate gender equality. Barry belonged to an intellectual circle of men and women led by feminist socialist Ellen Key and shows the two friends with their minds absorbed by contemplation of the landscape, an activity women were also capable of. The tranquility symmetry and peaceful coexistence of humans with nature depict a vision of Hugo that originated in 18th century Denmark and constituted an ethos integral to Scandi Scandinavian social democracy. Thank you. Mm -hmm.